I think every generation has the architecture in their heart of what church needs to look like to their generation. I think of the book of Acts that speaks of David serving the purposes of God in his generation. Sometimes the problem is that we who are the older generation begin to prescribe what the next generation's church needs to be. And yet, Jesus himself said that there's new wine and there's new wineskins. And so we need to be confident and comfortable enough to explore what that wineskin can look like in our time. I limp when I think of the millennials who are certainly here in America tapping out of church. Uh, some of them have been homeschooled, some of them have been in Christian colleges, and yet they have tapped out, feeling maybe their faith is still valid, but certainly the practice of their faith in community is no longer valid. Uh, it's also true of what two sociologists call church refugees. They are Generation Y, they are boomers, who equally have tapped out, have fallen out of love with the church, and I'm curious as to what has caused that. But I think the architectural piece is essential. In order to ensure that we build well, I think there are five things that are our matrices for architecture to make sure we don't drift into either progressive liberalism or I think the cold, blunt fundamentalism which has made the church really boring and distant. The first is obviously scripture itself. Uh, not just a cursory reading of the text. That's valuable and enjoyable as a devotional reading. But to have the confidence to burrow down into the scriptures and to see what's in there. What's the polity? What's the language? What are the great big God ideas? What is the alternative good life that Paul and the other writers offer even in the 21st century? And I think if we keep scripture front and center, we allow Jesus and the gospel to be our sustained message. I think we're going to start well. The second piece that I love is that it needs to be a relational story. Uh, America, sadly, has been the catalyst of church that is either business-driven in its shape and form or architecturally driven by the celebrityism of a major voice, a major player, an attractive person, a person of great gifting. And I think those are all extremely dangerous. Jesus avoided fame. He avoided being made king. He ducked and he dived away from that sense of, of public worship. Um, and I think that if we can keep relationships front and center with our architecture, we're probably going to get closer and closer to a good picture of the church. Thirdly, I think it's got to be reproducible. The gospel is global. The gospel is not just for my neighborhood or for my socio-demographic it is for the nations of the world, all 7 billion plus people on the planet, whether it is Paris or Timbuktu, whether it is Delhi or the Sudan. What is the architecture that can reach those spaces and places? And I think our dream needs to ensure that it is reproducible and leading into that fourthly affordable. Um, I listened to some of the church plant catalysts and you've got to raise 50,000 and you've got to have a team and uh, you've got to have a school hall or a building and the list gets ever longer as if that is the biblical requirement. Nope, the biblical requirement is a man or a man or a woman or a woman or a team who say yes to the God adventure, who say yes, we're going to go to a place and love them with Christ. We're going to be Christ, we're going to speak Christ. We're going to share Christ, and uh, that is more than enough for Merrill and I when we planted this church. I think God had such a smile on his face. Uh, a church didn't send us. There was no guaranteed income. We didn't have a team. And I remember thinking to the Lord, wow, this is a little radical at 57 to be doing it without all those things. And the only thing God would do is ask me a question over and over again. Will you trust me? Will you trust me? Will you trust me? And I think it's the affordability of trust that we need that God's called me to and I'm going and I'm going to see the hand of God provide. And then fifthly, it's being missional. It is ensuring that we live for the benefit of others. Many church plants become self-absorbed. They live for themselves. They want to just gain five more people, just get a cooler venue, a nicer band. And I think we miss the greatest punch of church planting, and that is living for the benefit of others. Andy Rogers is one of my great 
Uh, Heroes is a young church planter in San Diego. He has absolutely no passion to grow a big church. They four years in, they want to plant a church every year, which they've done, and they've never grown their home base beyond 120, 150 people. But they give sacrificially, they live sacrificially, they have found the joy of living for reasons beyond themselves. And that missional idea is central to how we plant churches. So, yep, we need to be biblical, relational, reproducible, affordable, and definitely missional. And those are the guardrails that I think will ensure